Well, everybody used to come to the bridge. You know, when you hit the bridge, you, your tires make a different sound because of the metal grating on it. And, uh, you know, people just forever, I mean, people now that are my age and older remember coming to the beach, and when they hit that grade, they knew they were at the beach. That was just a, another thing, you know. And coming this way, when you could look up and you could see that bridge, you knew you were there. So then you didn't have to say, are we there yet? Are we there yet? I'm sure that everybody's had their kids ask them that a thousand times. And uh, so at that, at that point, are we there yet would end, would end and because you would know you were at the beach. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people who come from on vacation down here, that's their that's when their vacation starts. When they hear that bridge, them tires rolling across that bridge, they all jump up and that's when it all begins there. They know they're on vacation then. Um, waiting traffic. Uh, whenever the bridge is open to boats and uh, which people didn't mind living on the island, but visitors often get impatient. And the islanders say, too bad, that's the way it is. And uh, they live with it. And enjoy, just enjoy the island. Back when I was coming, you could always come across the swing bridge and the noise the tires made going across it. You remember, I remember that noise. And uh, you could always tell whenever it hit the highway because the noise was different from anything you'd ever heard. And it would always jar your memories of, of where you were heading and what you were going to do and how much you were going to enjoy yourself. And I know, and we thoroughly did. I'm Carol Ann Ross, and uh, my family moved here in 1955. And I grew up in one of the old military barracks that was used by the, uh, I think the Army built those uh, during World War II. When you cross that, that swing bridge, and you hear that click, 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 as you go across, it's, to me, it's heartwarming. I feel it, and you smell that, the smell of the sound, you know, in the salt air, along with the click, 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 click. You know, it's a wonderful feeling. So, it's a deep feeling. Um, kaplunk, kaplunk, kaplunk. That's, that's what I remember. You go across that bridge and it's kaplunk, 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 and you're home. That's what it, it, going across that bridge, I always felt I'm home, I'm in this world that I love. Where Publix is now, or where Publix is going in, to the island on both sides of 50. And after you cross the bridge, they owned a quarter of a mile, almost a quarter of a mile, in each direction going north and going south. Well, Dad and all the boys owned all the property and the and the boys later divided their property and the way they divided their dad's property was um, if you went over and you put something on that building on, on that land then they sort of said okay that's your property and then they moved on to the next the swing bridge adds a, um, not adds, it is part of Surf City. Um, I, I think without it, it's going to take away um, the flavor, a certain flavor of the island. Right now, we are a quaint, family-oriented beach. We've always been, and I'm seeing that disappear every day. Um, there's very little for kids to do here. 
and when I was growing up there were arcades all over the place and you could go to the fishing piers and and you didn't have to pay to go on the fishing piers <laughs> uh, unless you were going to fish but the kids could go out. Back then the, the sand dunes was numerous and pretty high and our beach area was uh, was pretty wide going down to the to the beach. Uh, over time erosion and development and everything else has eat away the sand dunes as well as most of our beach. But it's still a beautiful place to live. It's a very quiet place to live. Uh, it's laid back. It's kind of Mayberry by the sea. And progress, to me, this, this bridge is not progress. Not progress at all. Um, but then that's my opinion. Uh, and, you know, those of us that were born and raised over there, or, or that have been here, coming to the island for 20 years or, or more. You know, it's, they may want to see all this change in some ways. And um, I'm gonna miss it. It's it, watching what is happening now, it's like watching somebody not off my arm. It's such a part of my life. It's, there won't be that clunk, 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 that makes you feel safe, that makes you feel this is where you belong. You know, like Daddy and his brothers wanted was a fishing village. And now people are trying to turn it into, and not just the newcomers, but people that are wanting uh, another dollar, and everybody has to live, I understand that. But people get greedy. We got greedy. The Batses got greedy. I'm Dee Dee Pagliotti Lloyd. I've grown up in Sur City all my life. I'm Yogi, probably have heard of me before. <laughs> Famous surfer from the 60s and lived here all my life, minus six years. Born in Brussels, Belgium. Got here as fast as I could. And, and the roundabout to me looks, you know, we're not used to roundabouts. We're used to going across the bridge and coming back across the bridge, not circling around and then circling again and then you got to circle again. You know, that's going to make a big change. It won't for the newcomers. Maybe the newcomers will be, they're used to it in their cities or the cities that they frequent. But for the, uh, the people that came to the island and love the island for what it is, I think it's a real disappointment. And I think the roundabout actually will help. You know, we won't have the stoplight that way. So uh, that's one less worry that the police department will have is trying to stand out there, keep traffic moving to get it back across the bridge while it's open. <laughs> I used to wish that that bridge would turn into a high-rise bridge. When that, uh, when we got the high-rise down North Topsail, I used to wish this bridge was like that. So now with this new high-rise coming up, I don't know. I know there's a lot of mixed feelings about people don't want the bridge to go. I don't think I'm one of them. They're more worried about the roundabouts than they are the yep. bridge. Yep. Everybody's. I went to the town meeting about it, and that's all they talked about was the roundabouts. So I hope they're studying their driver's handbook right now. <laughs> but I don't know. Is when the bridge goes, then that's probably when it's going to hit you. But right now, every time it stops you, I'd be glad when it's out of here. No, I, th I think it'll just take people a little longer to learn the, the roundabout. And another thing too is, you know, the ones going south that's coming onto the island will not actually go into the roundabout because there'll be a cutoff 
lane there that just goes straight south. Uh, that'll cut down a lot of traffic that's going into the roundabout. Uh, and then coming, when they're coming off the island from the south, it'll just be, uh, you know, one turn off anyway. They'll, be, they'll take the first turn off when, after they go into the roundabout. So that makes it a little easier. Oh Lord, <laughs> a lot of change around Surf City for one thing. They're just building and traffic increasing. And one thing I'd like to make clear that that bridge did not cause the traffic back up because they'd sit there for hours at a time and the traffic be backed up to Holly Ridge or somewhere. But it was just the traffic flow and of course the bridge caused it a lot too. And Fourth of July was something else with the fireworks and, and traffic. But it all worked out good. Like the boaters and the traffic was pretty good about working with us. Don't ever try to outrun the bridge neither. When he puts the yellow light on, like I did one time, he let me get out there and then he put the gates down on me. So I backed up and drove on the bridge there, and he won't move the bridge unless you get off of it. So he opened up the gates for me. As soon as I take off, he put two gates down behind me and had me trapped. And all the people were laughing at me right then. But I still go for it every now and then. Every now and then. If I'm the first car there and I see that yellow light, I just gun it. I said, I'm no, I learned my lesson on that because I'm not doing that no more. Because I had to stop right there in the car was looking at like, how stupid are you? I was, I was stupid enough to get caught. We used to tease about, we would know who was working the bridge, how fast it opened and closed. Uh, <laughs> and there was a difference. Some of them was very careful with it. Some of them was not as careful, I guess you'd say. Uh, of course, one thing about it, if, you, if they did turn it too fast, there was a chance of them breaking a part on that bridge. And they have done that before. I'm Faye Betts. I worked at the bridge for about 19 years. I started in September of 2090. What? I'm sorry, 1990, September 1990, and retired in September 2009. This is my very first job with the bridge. It come about kind of as an accident. A good friend of mine got it hang. Was hanging around with my husband here at the house. There's an opening at the bridge, his girlfriend worked there. So I went down and applied for it. I think it was like on a Monday or something. And Thursday night, 11 o'clock, I went to work at the bridge. Uh, well, I walked in and saw this panel of lights. I said, ain't no way I can do this. But anyway, we, we opened the bridge you know, training and we'd open it you know, a couple of times during the night. And I got used to it. And so it, it became a good job. I mean, it was... The bridge is kind of... You know, I've been around it ever since it was put there. I was born here, so I, I knew about it. My dad worked for a short time as a relief operator. This was after I married and moved away. But I knew people here that worked on it good friends and family. Yeah. That was on the end down under the bridge on this end. Um, I walked across the fender system underneath and breezed that and then I had some fittings up along the side of the bridge. Each operator had a different section. How often would you have to grease it? I think it was every two weeks it had to be greased. Both of us. My dad was Lacey Atkinson, I'm Lacey Atkinson Jr. and his daddy was James Franklin Batson. James Franklin Batson. And there was another man. Uh, all my memories is of the three main men who, who worked there from the time it was built in 55 till the early 70s. Earl Batts. Earl Batts. Yeah, it was Lacey Atkinson, James Batson, and Earl Batts were the three main 
uh, they were like a family, which I've expressed those views a lot. They always swap shifts if they needed to, and uh, if something happened to the bridge. Back then, it wasn't uncommon that once or twice a year for the power to go out or a storm or something, and they would all come down there, and even in the middle of the night if they had to, and they used to have a crank that could turn the bridge by hand, you know, and uh, they always helped each other out. At one time, it was 12 hours a day, yeah. uh, 12 hours day shift or night shift, and then I finally moved to eight hours, I think, huh? I don't even remember when they moved to eight, but I think they did, yeah. It was, in the late 60s or somewhere along in there, they cut it back a little bit. But yeah, it was 12 hour shifts. For eight hour shifts, we worked all three shifts. We we changed every four or five days. We worked so many days and be off two or work sometimes four days and be off three. We'd get off at midnight and not have to go back until three o'clock in the afternoon, three days later, so kind of a long, Time between, but sometimes you get off at, in the morning and you have to come right back at midnight. <laughs> so it, it turned out to be a good good thing. Yeah. Charge City Bridge, go ahead, Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, small passenger vessel. I request an open northbound. Roger, Captain. Uh, we open at the top of the hour. I can open for two o'clock. We're a uh, commercial vessel, Captain. Oh, okay, Captain. I'm sorry, I didn't uh, didn't hear that. I'll, I'll go ahead and over for you. Okay, thank you, sir. I never could figure out just exactly how those bridge tenders could stop that bridge exactly where it needed to be and then turn back and, and, and lock it in. But they served a great function and, and a vital part of keeping the transportation on and, and off the beach. Uh, they, were, they were great at their jobs. They were very, very well known for the marinas around as well as local citizens around. And a lot of them did live here locally and, and they, they did a great job. They were on call 24 hours a day and as bad as the visitors as well as some of the locals had to wait for the bridge to open and close. We got accustomed to it and we could set our clocks and we'd always, we'd make sure we didn't move on the, on the hour because that's when the bridge opened in most cases unless there was a commercial vehicle coming through and then they would go ahead and open it for the commercial vehicle. But it was quite a sight to see and uh, quite a, an amazement back in those days. I was coming ever since 1959. Uh, I don't remember the old uh, platoon bridge. I remember hearing people talk about it. I never saw it. Uh, the first bridge I saw was the uh, Swing Bridge, which is one of the last remaining trust swing bridges in the state of North Carolina that's active. We lived, oh, crossing the bridge, going over to the island, though, you had to go across on the pontoon bridge, which at the time my uncle, Earl, was a bridge tender and he'd have to go um, he'd go to and let any car that was going off the island he'd lift up that arm and let them through then when they got to a certain point he'd lift up the arm for the people that were coming on for them to come through but you'd go across it and it would you'd go down and bump like an old I don't know when it was put here. There was another pontoon before that one. And it was, it was operated with a outboard motor, I think. A real pontoon. I don't know. I, I remember the second pontoon bridge. Uh, it got washed away in 1954 during Hurricane Hazel. It was a rough time getting on and off that pontoon depending on the tide. If the tide was low, you'd have to drop way down, or high, you'd have to go up on a bump to get over it. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, it was really an ordeal opening that and closing that thing. It was run by cable. They live yep. with it. The other thing that uh, pops in is uh, 
what it replaced, the pontoon bridge that was there from World War II up until 1954-55 when the bridge replaced it. And that uh, pontoon bridge was considered a muffler eater because at high tide it was high and at low tide it was low and when you drove across it in a car it was quite hazardous because of going up over the hump or down. So the swing bridge was an innovation that everyone welcomed because it made it so much more less hazardous to get across the water. And it never met. It was always rickety. Uh, depending on the tide. Sometimes it was a little higher up and sometimes it was a little lower down. And my first memory of the pontoon bridge, I was, what, two years old, three years old, four years old. I was very, very afraid of it. And I would c cuddle up to my dad as close as I could because <laughs> He fell off in that water. I wanted to be where he could catch me. It was like a nightmare. <laughs> you said a prayer when you got on and one when you got off. It was just, you had to be, you had to get on it at a certain time. And it was just, it was just, it was scary. So I remember the pontoon bridge. She's right, it was scary. I can imagine it'd be like trying to fall off in the water, being up on a, a barge. It was basically a barge, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, yeah. The swing bridge was a blessing in disguise, really, you know. For those who didn't know about the pontoon bridge, they don't, they, they don't like the swing bridge. But for, for, but for those of us that's been here, the swing bridge has a lot of sentimental value to it. Uh, I, I remember it. Uh, my dad. My dad was a fisherman, and he enjoyed coming down here on the weekends. And sometimes when the spots were running and all, we'd come during the week and spend the night fishing. And go back the next morning. And of course, he'd go to work. I don't know how he did that, but he did. He managed. But we started in '59, uh, and I've been coming in right with him up until his death, which was uh, in '75, 1975. And uh, then my wife and I started uh, probably in. Uh, 79 to 80 coming down and uh, stayed down at the Sea Vista Motel on the weekends and, and during the weeks and, and vacation in the summer down there. Well, see, the swing bridge had started prior to Hazel and uh, they had, had, were building the embankments up and uh, putting the bulkheads in and everything for the new bridge when, the, when Hurricane Hazel came through. <clears throat> and so what had happened at that time, originally the pontoon bridge was in the same place that the swing bridge is at now. And, uh, but they had moved the pontoon bridge over to the north side and built a new, another road into it from either way and uh, so that they could put the swing bridge in the same place that the pontoon bridge was, which kept the road straight. And uh, so everybody knew that the bridge was coming in when we lost the uh, pontoon bridge during the hurricane. So, I mean, we were all excited about that bridge coming in, like we were excited about the new high-rise bridge coming in now. So, uh, and I, it took them really it looks like from the way they're going on this, it took them longer to put that little swing bridge in than it did this new high-rise bridge. Yes. Uh, there's there's duct tape tap. They have they have replaced bolts and bolts. They have uh, replaced uh, added on iron and welded it to. You can't find any parts for a bridge like this. They don't make those anymore. So anytime something tears up, like well, they tore the latch up. Uh, I don't know what a year or two ago. Uh, they went too far and came back too fast and it popped that latch off that locks the bridge in place. That was one thing that held it up because one of the pins that. I'm not saying it was because it broke too far, but one of the pins that lock it in place was broken and the new pin had to come out of Raleigh. So it took a little while to get it uh, repaired. That was about the longest it was down any time lately. Uh, and that's why the bridge was shut down for four hours or six hours. I can't remember exact length of time, but they literally handmade 
that part and welded it back on because you couldn't find one. There was no, you couldn't buy one, you couldn't find one. They don't exist. So they had to take the old one and, and do what the old blacksmiths used to do. They had to make one. And so they made one and put it on and it's worked great, which I'm, I'm thankful for. But that's just some of the obstacles that, that, it, that you face with that old, old type of bridge. That when the bridge would break down, they had a uh, handle that they put into some mechanism and they could turn the bridge by hand. Nowadays, if the bridge breaks down, they got to send all the way to Burgal, I think, to get somebody to come out. But back then, you could turn the thing by hand. So, progress, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I found that out the hard way. <laughs> Tell me about that. Well, I hadn't been working there too long, and I had a, a dredge tow come through, which they're usually, they could be up to a half a mile or a mile long of dredge and tugs. I said, well, it went on through and I went to close, I closed the bridge and it got maybe half, two thirds closed and it stopped. I didn't know what was wrong with it. But anyway, it just so happened that the guy that used to work there was, had been over to Hardy's to eat and he was on the you know, the beach side, he could get on the bridge. So he come up and they had this big Y thing. It's like a, it's probably a foot and a half or so. Anyway, there's a place on the bridge that you put that and this long piece of pipe that had been hanging on the side of the bridge. We got that and put in each end of that thing and, and actually manually turned it to close, finish closing the bridge. It closed real easy, but you just have to walk around that thing to turn it. The largest one I saw was a museum. I can't remember, uh, I think it was a, a NASCAR museum uh, from Richards down out of Florida. It was coming up the intercoastal waterway and when I saw it, I said, that boat will never go through the swing bridge. It's just, it's just too wide. It, the swing bridge is too narrow. Ooh, lots of big boats. Uh, one in particular, you know, uh, President, they think it was named Bush just died and they sent his the plane that he had that he flew to Smithsonian it came through on a, a, a barge I guess because they didn't get any pictures of it but they had it had the wings cut down and were, it was on the barge I let that through so that was oh my god there was one that did that just barely made it through I think it was uh, that floating art museum it's a huge white ship. When it passed through Searcy Bridge, there's pictures of it. I, I used to have one, but I lost it. But it was four stories over the bridge. It dwarfed the bridge. I mean, I don't know how it got through it. I, I, we didn't think it was going. We thought it was going. It to looked like stuff. the Titanic. It was huge. It was huge. It's a, look at it it's the world's largest floating museum or art museum. So I watched the boat and I, I jumped out and went around to the swing bridge just to see. And in looking at it, it looked like it probably had three feet on each side of clearance, because it was a huge, huge boat. And uh, it, I would estimate it was probably somewhere around 175 to 185 feet long. I seen a cruise ship come through, yeah. not a big one, but uh, and it was they had to slow right down to get through the fenders, to eased right through. It was, I bet there weren't a foot on either side many years ago. Seen a couple of houses come through, uh, but, but it's, it's amazing. I think we probably brought one of the most unusual vehicles through, and that was a two-story uh, building, a house. And uh, we brought a uh, 
building from the mainland over to this location and uh, by barge and we had to come and go through the bridge and then land on the opposite side of the bridge over here and bring it up. And then the other one was that big yacht that went by when we were standing on the bridge. When it was turning this big, it was one of the biggest yachts I had ever seen. And it was all young people on it. And we were like, can we come? Can we come? And they were like, jump. And we almost did. But it, I mean, it was, when it was going through the bridge, it seemed like the front of it was touching the bridge and the back of it was just moving through. And we used to go fishing under the bridge. So uh, I know people still do that. They still fish under the bridge. That's, uh, I, a lot of people have, there's kind of like a little trail that goes up underneath the bridge. It goes from the side of the bridge up underneath it. And there used to be, north, the north side of the bridge was where a lot of people uh, that grew up here learned to swim. Uh, it was right there. That's where uh, Thomas Tackle Shop used to be. They had uh, daddy's, uh, Larry's daddy and my daddy had, a, had boats down at the base of the bridge. Small 16 foot skiffs with shrimp nets and spot nets. And that's, uh, they done a lot of, made a lot of their living uh, in the sound. Orchard shrimping and uh, fishing, spot fishing. <clears throat> and also boat rentals. Yeah, there was some boat rentals down there. Well, we would always come in the fall when spots ran, and uh, he he had he loved the he loved the beach. He uh, joined the navy uh, when he was young, and he loved the beach. And he'd always come and like to come down and fish and uh, mess around and, and see see what was happening, things and what the development was going. Uh, but we'd come down and we'd fish for fall in the spots. Uh, we'd come down in the summer and flounder, do some flounder jigging, uh, and we we probably made 10, 12 trips a year down here fishing. Uh, I do, and one of the special memories that nobody, not many people remember, I say something about it and people just don't remember it, but after they built the new bridge, <clears throat> a lot of the concrete or the asphalt from the old bridge was under the, under the on this side, under the uh, concrete part of the new bridge. And uh, so we used to do a lot of playing under there. You could play under there when it was raining, you know, you wouldn't get wet. Uh, also, the church used to have fish fries. Our church at the time was very young, just getting started. And we raised money by going across those mounds to sit under the partial piece on the land that was being built to the swing bridge and we had fish fries there. And uh, we would have them underneath there on that platform and you're right there on the waterway, you know. And uh, of course it was a good place to go crabbing and all that stuff. It was right beside Alvin Batts' campground. We went in through the campground, went over to it. And uh, so, but now that has been eroded and washed completely out over the years. Sometimes we'd get down and walk around the outside. You remember the railing yeah, that went yeah. around the house? Very right well. Enjoyed it. In the, especially in the summertime, he could look right down in the tugboat house and he'd flip his light on and sometimes he'd wave at you when he went through. Uh, well, I do know of someone, and I'll tell you who that is later if you want to interview her. She would throw a rope out onto the bridge and ride out with it when it opened. So that was pretty cool too. So we had a lot of interesting people on this island back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and I guess since then too. We had a road, we had a swing, and it was... When the bridge was about to turn, you'd swing out there and drop off, not in the middle of the bridge, though, but before you in got the water. there. Yeah, but that wasn't easy, because I about drowned, and that was the last time I did it because the guy that went in front of me made it look like, hey, just drop and swim. So I dropped and I kept on going down and he had to come back in and get me. So after that, we just stayed in the rafters. We didn't, I didn't swing, I didn't drop anymore. We would swing on the rope, but I would stay on that rope. I didn't drop back down in the water. I was uh, kind of in awe of Dee Dee because Dee Dee was very uh, adventurous and she was not afraid of things. And, 
I always kind of stood back and watched in awe how, as, because Dee Dee would just, she just went and did it. She was a really cool gal. Yeah, I, I, we were the first ones that rode the waves here. Me and four or five other guys, we had the whole beach to ourselves. Not me. I tried it one time and went underneath that wave, thought I was going to drown. That was it. We skipped school and just hung out on the beach. <clears throat> and every now and then the sheriff would, you know, tell our parents that we were playing hook. But I, sheriff would bring them home. <laughs> there was no problem back then because uh, we'd go to high school at Topsail, you know, and as soon as we got there, we'd write our own notes to get out of school and come back home and go surfing. Yogi, Yogi is a character. I love, I love all of these people that I mentioned. I do. They're all wonderful, wonderful people. And I miss, miss uh, having the friendships uh, from back then. They were interesting. Surf City at that time was like Never Never Land. Uh, we had freedoms that I don't think a lot of kids had who grew up in towns or cities. We were allowed to do whatever we wanted to do, pretty much but I don't think anybody wanted to do anything bad. There wasn't any trouble to get into back then. So we, between the marsh and the ocean, uh, life was wonderful. It still is. Topsail Island, Surf City is a great place to be. It's a wonderful place to be. Well, when you live three miles away and it takes you an hour and a half to get over here, well, something's got to be done. We never had the problems back in early years like we did, there might be 15 cars waiting for the bridge now. Now it backs all the way up. All Walmart. The well, all the way up to Lowe's on 210 because that's where, that's where I live at. And I had to take a right and go through Lowe's parking lot to get, I said, I'm not doing that. So I just go on 17, go over the high rise. I'm like, it, I mean, it, it's crazy. Something's got to be done. And when you come across that bridge, you're coming into this other world. You're hearing it. And to me, this big cement thing that they're putting up is cold and impersonal. And our little swing bridge is all about, wee, joy. <laughs> you know, you're home. You're, you're, somebody's going to take care of you. The little stanchions on there are going to take care of you. Yeah, I don't know how I'm going to feel when it's finally gone. I realize I've taken my last ride over it. I might, ride, gonna hit you. I might ride over it four or five times that day and probably be crying, but still, I'm ready for this new one. It's just a matter of getting people on and off here as fast as you can, you know, and safety too, you know. I think it should have been um, maybe left there at one of the berms that come up left to the side, it could be uh, used for several things. It could have been used for fishing, uh, be a great place for families. And of course, they'd have to make some you know, adjustments so, so people wouldn't fall off <laughs> the edges of it. Or it could be made into a restaurant um, or a little uh, hot dog stand, whatever but it could be useful. It is a historic piece. It's been here since 1955, late 55, I believe. And uh, I'm sure you've had people tell you about it was supposed to be built, put up in 54 and Hurricane Hazel came and it was delayed until 55, so you know all that. I think it would have been nice if they could have made it uh, something a little closer to the island, like around the park somewhere to be used for something, you know. It would have been a nice thing to do, but I can understand why they couldn't probably do it, you know, because of the environmental issues with it, you know, and the money it would probably cost to correct it at taxpayers' expense, probably. You know, people grumble about having to wait <coughs> while the bridge is open. Um, but it gives you a chance to review the beauty. I mean, look at, it's beautiful there when you're sitting waiting for that bridge to close back so traffic can go over. 
I'm gonna miss, I can hear it here, the siren when the boat's coming, when they're, if they're getting prepared to put the gates down, they'll blow that siren about three times. The bet, when you go over the bridge and you get caught, usually we're one of the first cars because they see us coming. So the gates go down and you, then when you just stop and watch the bridge turn, you just start staring at the bridge. And you can remember the house that used to be on top where the bridge tender used to stay. Well, most people, including the visitors as well as our locals, that's, that's, part of, that's part of us. We look at the swing bridge as being part of us. That, that's part of our generation. That's part of Topsail Island. And it has a lot of uh, the thoughts that goes along with it. That's what you're not gonna know until you actually see it not there anymore. And then that's when it's gonna hit you that it's never gonna be the same. And uh, that bridge brings a lot of people home Topsail Island or Surf City is more than just a place. It really is an experience. And to me, it's a very spiritual experience. And when they don't see that bridge, they're not gonna feel like that that's their home anymore. I mean, right now with all the new people moving on the island, and it kills me to hear somebody that, oh, I've been here five years, I'm a local. I'm like, you're not no local. The swing bridge was a blessing in disguise, really, you know. For those who didn't know about the pontoon bridge, they don't they, they don't like the swing bridge. But for, but for those of us that's been here, the swing bridge has a lot of sentimental value to it. Regardless of where I've been, and I've traveled a little bit, and I've lived different places, but coming across that bridge and hearing that clunk, 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 it's like you're safe. You're on this place where nobody can hurt you, where people love you or uh, care about you and are in a different frame of mind, I guess. You're here on this island Tourists come here to have a good time. They're not coming here to do bad things. <laughs> They're here to enjoy life. So there's a different sense, a different feeling when you come here. And I think that feeling permeates the island. But I think they're gonna miss that, uh, hearing that sound of the tires going across the bridge and knowing that they have reached their destination of Topsail Island. Uh, the other thing that I think they're, uh, they're gonna miss, but they have an opportunity to see it, uh, most people don't realize we have built a wooden replica of the swing bridge behind East Coast Sports that ties in Soundside Park with the, uh, where the roundabout's going to be on, on the uh, new bridge. Uh, so if we ever have some people in the generations uh, coming up that wonder what it used to look like, they can go see that replica and be able to tell what it looked like. The only thing, it doesn't swing, but it, it has, it's crossed a little canal there. Uh, behind East Coast Sports, and it looks just like the bridge we have today. The only thing missing is the bridge tender uh, observation box. Right now they might be cussing at it because it catches them and they think that it's waiting for them to get right to that first gate before they drop it. But as soon as it gets gone and that we have to deal with the high rise, which we don't know how, you know, if that's going to be any better. Then it might I'm just I'm mind. just waiting for the view of the top of that high rise. That's all I care about. It's going to be spectacular. I don't think that old bridge gone is even going to bother me for a while. Even though I will miss it, I'm going to have to say I'll miss it. But I sure won't miss the heartache of it right now. The traffic. Uh, now the new bridge will make it a lot easier. I think people will be probably more willing to run off the island for something uh, because it'll just make it a lot easier getting over to the mainland and back. A lot of people used to say that they, when they, they would get all their stuff on the, the bring with them before they came across the bridge because they didn't want to worry about having to get back across that bridge. And I don't think we'll have the blockage that we do, especially like on, you know, Friday evenings, Saturday, uh, Sunday evenings, everybody leaving and coming on and all that stuff. So I don't think we'll have the block up there. I see the pit 
the two berms ending and there's nothing there. And it's just a void, a void that when, um, when someone you love is not there anymore. So you do think of the sunshine. Uh, you think of the nice things, the nice way it made you feel. And that's the way you have to hold on to it. Because if you don't, if you think of the negative, you're gonna be miserable. Like the old lady said, it's a sad time. Hmm. Well, it's a new beginning. Yep. Nothing stays the same. I was at the ribbon cutting for both bridges. Yep. Yeah. Larry sure was. You went with your daddy to when he opened the uh, swing bridge up. Yep. I was there at the ribbon cutting. How old were you then? Nine years Nine old. Nine years old. People will, will miss, uh, kind of like uh, losing a family member or, or losing someone close to the family. It's something you've gotten used to and you've lived with all your life, but uh, it's gone and, and life goes on and, and you must go on and, and change, is, change is good. Uh, sometimes we think it's not, but when you get down to it, uh, it is good. Uh, the change in this case, uh, it's going to be a, a lot safer coming onto the island than what it has been. Mm, I don't know. I hate to see it go, but I can't live in the past. You have to get over it. It's like the death of anybody that you love. You have to let go. You will let go. Sometimes it takes longer than you anticipate, but you have to let go.